What is wrong with the Kalam cosmological argument? Uh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> I often use it as an example of a valid method because you know the, you can construct a Kalam cosmological argument that is logically valid, but in a bogus way. So all the premises are not established, so you can't establish the conclusion. And uh, in, in the bare bones Kalam, you just have uh, you know everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. Now, of course, in that formula, you haven't really gotten to God, right? You're just saying that, that there's a cause, uh, and it could be all sorts of different things. And in cosmological science, they come up with all kinds of really valid first cause theories that don't require an intelligence or any, any like uh, a conscious agent to be involved. So the argument kind of like fails just basically in that sense. And usually there's a hidden premise that gets to the conclusion of God. And that, that fourth premise, that third premise, whatever it is, it's something like, uh, well, if it can't be mechanical until the universe exists, therefore it must be personal. Uh, and therefore you get God out of that somehow. But then of course the same logic doesn't follow, uh, the same logic follows for personal causes. So if, if, if the personal cause also exists, then it needs a cause and so on. Um, and you know, there's ways around this, but this gets into that whole, you know, uh, whack-a-mole uh, project. But in reality, when we get to the basic premises, we don't actually have any evidence that the universe in, in the required sense had a beginning because you can talk about the Big Bang, which is the beginning of this universe. But we actually, you talk to any cosmologist, literally any of them, uh, and they'll tell you that we don't actually know that there wasn't a universe before this. Even if you talk about the uh, bordeguth vilenkin theorem, which argues that even if there's a cascade of other universes before ours, it has to stop at some first universe, right? Even though it's billions and billions and billions of universes ago. Uh, even that is based solely on the assumption that classical space-time remains consistent all the way back, which we know is not true. Uh, in fact, once you get to the smallest scales where you would get to a singularity, where you would get to anything that would be like a Big Bang, you're at the quantum scale. And so the whole idea of classical space-time falls apart and all bets are off, right? So, uh, so even the BGV doesn't establish that there was a beginning. Uh, so we can't actually establish even that there was a beginning, even if there was. The other problem, of course, is that uh, it actually is directly illogical to say that everything that begins to exist has a cause, because then you're talking about time, but you can't have anything before time, so you can't have really a cause of that. And if you're talking about causal laws, that's part of the universe that you're trying to explain, right? So if you're saying that everything has to have a cause, well, that's only true once there is something to have that kind of behavior. If you're talking about before the existence of even laws of physics, then it isn't true that you need a cause to begin something, because that, that only becomes true after it's caused, creating the sort of laws of physics that would require a causal system to operate. So if you're talking about something before the laws of causation exist, then the laws of causation by definition don't exist, so you, you don't get that premise either. And you can do the same sort of analysis with the personal mechanical causes, where you get to this whole idea, the defense, of course, is the idea that well, maybe God, he can't exist before the existence of time. That's illogical, that's like existing north of the North Pole. So maybe he did causation simultaneously. God created the universe simultaneously with the first moment of time. But once you do that, you've just thrown God out uh, as a necessary explanation, because you could have anything uh, simultaneous with the beginning. It could be just the first seed of the universe. And when you get to, uh, the other sides of these equations, the idea of like, if we look at what typically explains things, uh, it always turns out to be physics, right? Like it, God never turns out to be the explanation of anything. Everything we've researched, hundreds and hundreds, millions and millions of things for thousands of years, it always ends up being natural. So we should expect the first cause to be a natural thing, something like that. And also we should expect it to be very, very simple, right? If you're going to explain a really complex thing, you wanna get down to the most simplest thing that could cause it and lead to a cascade of building more complexity over time. And God is actually the most complex thing you can imagine in terms of the mind you're positing that this entity has is super complex. It's the most complex entity that is conceivable. Uh, and so that's, you're going in the wrong direction. You're going to a super complex thing that you haven't really explained the existence of to explain a less complex thing in the universe. It actually makes more sense when you look at, for example, um, you know, spontaneous uh, false vacuum theories, uh, quantum uh, mechanical, like where you have just a really simple quantum mechanical phase state change. Uh, and that kind of story, their super simple first causes are actually more likely and they actually have a basis in existing science. And uh, when you look at all of that, everything that I've just said, uh, the Kalam cosmological argument looks more like a top hat and cane dance uh, than an actual argument for God. Yeah, and in quantum physics, there are events with no apparent causes.
as well. Yeah, yeah. So, and, okay, so... Like, and causation is not you, found in fundamental physics, and, and they're time-reversible. Yeah, so... They so work backwards. Do you want me to spend some time on that, uh, answering that question? Because there's, there's a nuance there that is important. Uh, because uh, what, what a theist will say, so I'll take, like, let's devil's advocate here. What they'll say when you say that is, well, that's true, except that the kinds of things that can come out of a quantum field are limited, right? So there's some sort of laws of physics that are deciding what can spontaneously arise from a quantum field. So they'll say that, that the quantum field still has to be caused, right? Something like that. that's That's the argument they will say. So what I'm saying is not that uh, we have examples of things that are uncaused. And it's true that like the spontaneous uh, activities that can be explained through quantum mechanics, they actually are grounded in something fundamental, a quantum field, some sort of state of things that is, limits what actually can spontaneously arise. So you still have something to explain there, right? So there's still difference. So the, the problem with the argument is not that we can find examples of uncaused causes, because uh, technically that's a caused uncaused cause, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, the problem is that when you're saying everything began to exist, in the, the term everything are even the causal laws that I'm talking about, even the ones where you have like the grounding relationship of quantum mechanics that explains what spontaneously comes out of it, even that causality doesn't exist yet, right? So like that's part of everything. So when you're saying before everything, there has to be a cause that exists before everything that caused everything. Well, that includes a state of being where there is no causal laws at all, like not even conceptually, like not even the quantum mechanical laws, right? So the idea that you're trying to say that something has to have caused the quantum mechanical laws that explain the spontaneous uh, quantum mechanical behavior, um, even then you're running into the logical problem that I just pointed out, that you're positing a state before the existence of everything that lacks those laws. So you cannot get the second premise of the Kalam cosmological argument, that the idea that, that uh, everything that begins to exist must have a cause is actually false because your the very principle would not exist before everything existed. So the, the premise is self-refuting. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning that most physicists think the universe is eternal. That that's the consensus now. Uh, there's a new book called Battle of the Big Bang uh, showing all the different models. And I looked through the table. There's like a table at the end and the ones that definitely had a beginning in time are literally one out of like 25. Right. <laughs> so yeah. It's also, also point out like uh, uh, cosmologists, even the cosmologists who argue for a uh, past finite system they're they're de they tend to be multiverse theorists first of all because like so you look at like Vilenkin, like he agrees that there are like billions of different universes before ours yeah he right? thinks like there's a multiverse yeah he's so. he's not saying that everything began with the big bang that's usually the trick that christians will pull is as if well cosmologists think the everything began with the big bang that's like that's not true anymore um you can get to like hawking's model which would be like one of the few i don't even no know boundary any, yeah right i don't even know if there are any that's kind of that's kind of an eternal yeah, well, it's way. it's a it's a self-causing theory, so you have time yeah. loops back on itself, etc. So it, right. it does have it's past finite. Um, almost no one it buys that anymore. Like that's not a popular model anymore. But uh, but even that, like even Hawking, if you were to talk to Hawking, or you can and, talk and, to Hawking. And by the way, real quick, he and and uh, Penrose, they're the ones that popularize the singularity, and then they both. You know, kind of yeah, right. That. Yeah, yeah. They, they both, think it's sickly like eternal. Yeah, cycles. and it's important to note that they both gave up on that. Like they renounced that theorem because of the same reason that's the problem in the BGV theorem, which is that once you get to a certain scale, well, gravity no longer works, right? So you you can't get to a singularity. It's physically impossible. And this is because of quantum mechanics, right? So uh, the scale at which gravity will even interact is is actually finite. It doesn't. You can't keep, keep gravity working all the way down to a singularity. So, yeah. and we don't actually know what happens at that scale, right? Like so, that, and when they said that, they said, well, you can't actually get to a singularity in that sense. So what's happened since then is that cosmologists, when they use the word singularity, they're no longer using it in the Hawking-Penrose sense. Uh, even Hawking and Penrose stopped using it in that sense. They, they mean in terms of they use a more technical term, which is uh, 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 geodesic incomplete, where uh, the timeline goes back to a point and we do not know what happens after that. So it's not that it goes down to an infinite point, it goes to some point and then we don't know, there be dragons or whatever.